do not take away the satisfaction of having to see you grovel for it. Beg. Welcome, Mrs. Lysett. I'm so happy to have you here today. I've always wanted to speak with you. I've known you over the years, but we've never had the opportunity to sit down together, talk about your life, talk about your career, and just all the wonderful strides that you've made in many decades. And I'm happy this is happening today. Welcome. And you look really good. You look stunning as always. Thank you. Congratulations Thank on you. the success of King of the Boys. Thank Congratulations you. to Kemi Aditiba. Congratulations to the cast and the crew. They've made a TV show that has been talked about all over the world. But I'm going to jump right into it. You have two scenes in this Netflix series, yes. and it spawned a lot of reactions. It's even spawned memes. How does that make you feel? Very glad that the younger people are discovering that I exist. And I hope that it's it sparks something wonderful for everybody. You've had a remarkable career. And uh, I just wonder, did you always want to be an actor? No, I'm an accidental actor. I never did. There was not a time in my life that I dreamed that I'd be famous or an actor or anything in the theater. I wanted to be a lawyer. Uh, somebody just discovered me, as we say in show business. You know, I went to see a friend of mine to take that first thing, a, a, a man who was, uh, as we say in these parts, toasting me. <laughs> uh, and uh, I want to just look him over. Let's go chat, uh, have coffee. I was a civil servant. And after work, I went to the Royal Court Theatre. And uh, the director of the play just walked past and saw me in the foyer and approached me and asked whether I was uh, an actor. I said, no, I wasn't. He said they were rehearsing uh, Wally showing carefully. That was the premiere of The Lion and the Jewel. Wow. And would I like to take part? And I said, well, I had a holiday coming post while I took my holiday, early holiday. And I was given the holiday. And I joined the cast. And we opened. And all hell broke loose. Wow. And everybody thought I was an actor. It was on that night, one of, a member of the audience was uh, a woman who owned a big agency, management agency. Her name was Elizabeth Alan Jeffries. Oh, wow. And she signed me on. The following week, I was at the BBC working. I was doing radio plays. So the one thing from that, well, I don't know, I, I, don't, I don't want to uh, uh, preempt uh, <laughs> our dis discussion. Education is important. Oh, wow. What were you doing at the actor. time? Yeah. that you were discovered? Post office in, in England. It was during our time when I was working there that the post office tower that you all, when you go to London now, you see, I was part of that. So okay. when I go around London now and I see the post office tower, I have a proprietary... <laughs> feeling towards that. Yes, that yes. I knew about this landmark. Mm. I worked on it and all that. So I was working at that level when because people thought I was so talented. And where was I all their lives? And, and, I, and I thought, they mustn't know that this was my first production. Hmm. I didn't think there was anything, anybody so, so much of a genius, you can just go into it. And I thought, I better study. So I went and studied at, uh, uh, first of all, I studied at the City Literary Institute, which taught everything, early classes. Uh, at the dance center, Floral Street, when I was picked by a producer, a director, who was trying to do an opera at the Royal Opera House, Covent Garden. It's high for looting, high, you know, very well bred. The queen, uh, the queen opens, or the princesses, or the prince open the uh, the first the season. Uh, they must be at the opening, and I was chosen to be one of the dancers at uh, Wagner's, wow. Wolfgang uh, Wagner's Tannhauser. And it was just going on like this. Wow. 
So training is of the essence because when you when you learn what you're doing, uh, uh, it's also it's important to be in the right place at the right time because when you're in the right place at the right time, <laughs> doing the right things, well, you will meet people who give you the opportunity, the right opportunities to grow, and that's what happened to me. Going back to your uh, to your performance in King of the Boys, uh, the Return of the King, you have just two scenes. Your character, Chief Randall, who is the matriarch of the Randall family, is wearing a mohawk, something that we usually don't see on screen for women around your age. And I thought that was pretty interesting. Was that your decision or that of the directors? The director has to make the decision. An actor can't care because you, the director will design the program uh, uh, the, the project himself. It obviously fitted the, uh, the character. So the director agreed that I do it. That was my own hairstyle. Oh, wow. Though an old woman, uh, I'm an urban cowgirl, so to speak. That kind of woman makes her own laws. Mm -hmm. Chief Mrs. Randall, yeah. they rule the roost. They're very powerful. That's another thing about our women. We don't know our power. Women are very powerful. That woman, that was a, a quintessential African woman. And you've always played strong female characters. Was that a deliberate decision on your part or just something that came to you? No, I, I, I don't cast myself. People cast me. I must seem to them to be formidable, okay? Uh, powerful. I like women to be seen as powerful because we are powerful. It is not that women are strong. Women, women are already strong. Our duty is to make the world know about that strength. That's it. It's, no, I don't cast myself, uh, uh, but I think, uh, I, I imagine that people can see that strength and then they, they work to, to, to that one. Uh, and I'm not, uh, I'm not unhappy about that. Wow. So what's your, what, what, goes, how, what goes into your preparation for a role? How do you prepare for a role? I just read and read and read until I find the heart of the character. That sounds too precious. But you do find the character. You read and read and read because words are nothing. Words are cheap. You have to find the meaning of each word. Because when a writer puts strings, uh, uh, words together, it means something. And each word, I like to make each word mean something. Mm -hmm. I like to play on the subtext, we say. I like to play on the nuances uh, uh, in, in, my, in my dialogue. Uh, and speaking of words, I wanted to go back to another of your scene in King of the Boys, where you registered how unhappy you were with how your son's uh, second time ambition was being managed. You did use the F word, and that took us by surprise. Was that on purpose? Do you swear in real life? Of course I do. <laughs> when you're exasperated, uh, you use very, very colorful language. If you understand our, our own tradition, our own language, we are, uh, that, uh, being, being surprised about that is being too Western. Mm. Yeah, because it, it's a word. Yoruba don't have any other pseudonyms for you want me to use the word? <laughs> they don't. A woman, a lazy woman, for instance, doesn't put her back to work. What do the Yorubas call her? Alabodo. What can be more graphic than that? Wow. The Return of the King of Boys is a movie I love so much and I've watched over and over again. But with mommy um, Taiwo Ajayi likes it around, it's, it's, it's a wonderful experience. The acting is actually phenomenal. Really, really good production. The icing on the cake for me was Mrs. Ajayi Lysette. That um, scene where she was telling Mrs. Randall to beg, I love that part. I, I love, like, I just love everything about the scene, like the way actions played out along with the words, are poised, everything, structure, and in fact, the facial expression killed everything, like there was no mistake. Of boys, the return of the king, uh, the return of king has sparked a lot of conversation around feminism, around power dynamics, and around the gender dynamics, gender dynamics. in Nigeria's politics. 
Do you feel that women are fairly represented in our polity and politics in Nigeria? No, women are not uh, fairly represented. And a lot of that was discussed that people were asking Anyola Salami some stupid question they wouldn't ask a man. And some of it would come from, from women too. Women don't like women very much. And it's a plantation mentality. You, you know, we're, we're tokenism. It's tokenism that's at work. Extraordinary people, and there are more extraordinary women around. But for some reason, we've conditioned ourselves to feel that only men are entitled to, to power. And I can, in a way, in a perverted kind of way, perverse kind of way, I can understand that. Women give service. That's, how high, that's what we're high-wired high to do. We give service rather than uh, uh, display even power. People think giving service is weak. Exercising power is everything. Pure power. They think that's strong. But women know about giving service and looking after themselves. This business where people thought, think that women are weak. I like this film. I hope it inspires many girls to know that they can do anything. Not just run, not just run the underworld, but run their lives. How can Storytelling, what's the role of entertainment in setting agenda, generally for women empowerment, for women, or discourse around what affects the society? Well, I think we should start writing scripts for women. There's nothing wrong with a woman being a powerful entrepreneur. Mm. Let me go back to our tradition. You know, the people who build our old, whatever it is, market women, entrepreneurs sent their, their children to school, educate them, and looked after them. The man can afford to have three or six or seven wives. He just has them. He just throws his seed around. It has the children, but who looks after those children? The women. Mm. So they're managers. What we see in our country, we don't have managers. But women can manage. And we want other women. We need to write scripts like we did so other women can believe that women are, can be achievers as well mm -hmm. and that they can have power. They can use power well. They can look after themselves uh, and stop hiding behind men's uh, agbada as, uh, as happens now. What do you say to these um, comments that p uh, women usually get, where people say women are moved by emotion, men are moved by logic? So to say it seems to be interpreted that women cannot undo political positions, they cannot undo positions of power or leadership. Uh, what, do you, what do you have to say about that? I don't agree with that. What more do you want me to say? So yes, women must have emotions. What men, are, uh, what men are calling a logic is blindness to what they perceive to be weakness. They don't want to bother to do the, the, the hard lifting of caring about what happens to this, but uh, that or the other. It's, it's not macho enough. Mm, mm, but mm. women who know that, <laughs> what kind of country can you have or family uh, can you have if a lot of your people are not cared for, are not in good health, and mentally, physically, financially. Therefore, right now, see what's happening with countries where, uh, where they're run by women. See how long Angela Merkel has been in power. Yes. It's the best time Germany has had since post-war period. It's always, uh, if it's always, I always feel illuminated just hearing your commentary on politics. And I'm going to delve more. I mean, I've, I've, we've, we've talked over the years, your, your, your estimation and you articulate so well, is it Chicago politics, is it US politics, is it UK politics where you've lived, is it Nigeria politics? I just want to know, is there any time 
you ever considered going into politics or getting involved in politics? I don't know. I've never thought about it. Do you know why? I think I'm already in politics. I'm doing what politicians are supposed to do. You inspire people, you look after people, you contribute to their lives, physically, financially, in any way, which way that they want. That's what we're so, it's called service. I give service, my life's always been about service. I know you live on the mainland, and um, like you've just said, part of the reason why you live where you live is so that you, you are not far removed from the reality. You touch people. Yeah, you are not far removed from the reality yeah. on ground. What, what do you see is happening with, our, with the leadership and the citizenry in Nigeria today? How, how, do you think we're still in sync or we're speaking different languages? Completely different, lang different countries entirely, not just language. Our leaders live in another airy fairy world, quite divorced from their own people. Because, because how can you explain a, a, a situation where you don't have hospitals, properly functioning hospitals, you don't have medication for your people, drugs and that sort of thing. You don't have the infrastructure on the ground. But when you have a headache, you can take a plane and go abroad to Germany, to England, to America, to India, to treat you. You see the divide between the, uh, uh, the people and their leadership, and they don't have any conscience about it. I was reading uh, recently about uh, one of our leaders taking a vacation abroad. They are not thinking. No other country is going to leave their leaders to go to other countries to do delicate operations on them. It's a question of security, mm. a matter of security, and handle their own health and everything. It's also about sovereignty mm. to other people. They're now thinking about all that. And, everybody, and I hear people talk there about their patriotism, rubbish that, which uh, a leadership would not have education sorted out where your universities are, uh, have been on strike for four years and people, uh, a course that you can take for three years takes you seven years. Wow, yeah. But, but, because, but you don't worry because all your children are in Star Harvard uh, in England and America and India and Russia and whatever it is they have. What kind of heartlessness is that? Constant electricity. So we can't produce anything. And, and I hear people are surprised that the, the Naira is going down. It will be 1,000. I don't, you know, it's not intelligent discussion for me hmm. that the leadership will even be worrying about that when you're not producing anything to sell in exchange for, 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 for revenue. Cars. And, yes, I know. Yeah. Your agriculture has gone to ground. For instance, you have the difficulties of uh, the farmers uh, uh, being driven out of their farmland, so you can't you can't feed your citizens. And we are drinking milk, and we're having yogurt, and we're having well, what all sorts of things. All of them imported. We're not selling anything to anybody except fossil fuel. There is no concern about that. There is no service being given. What country would have a, con uh, 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 a leadership would do what we have here, where we don't have power? Constant uh, electricity. Constant ele electricity. So we can't produce anything, which we're not even, uh, 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 what do you call it, process here. Yes, it's exported, yes. Yeah, which is export. How are you going to tell me that these people boast of having logic? Are you going to tell me that those people are intelligent? Hmm. Who are not using emotion to say that if we do this, what's going to happen to, my, to our people? And they're there. And my message to women is they're sleeping with these men. What kind of pillow talk do they have? It's a special day for you. Uh, it's a special day. I, I understand it's the anniversary uh, with your late husband, Tom Lysett. And um, I know how passionately, how passionately you felt and uh, you feel about the relationship you had with your husband. And I just want to cast your mind back, uh, if you could tell us, or just reflect on the relationship and the kind of impact he had 
on your career as an actor? I wish you were here today. Uh, it was my greatest critic. Uh, apart from the fact that he re recognized that, yes, I should be, when I was busy doing this, that, and the other, I'm a generalist, really. And, uh, well, the same master of none, but I think I mastered all my, uh, all, all the things I'd, uh, I had peddled, if you like. But he said to me, he came to watch me in a production and decided, ah, acting, you should take up acting, you are an actor. Because I never thought I was an actor. I think that still dry, uh, drives me. I think I thought I was an imposter. I mean, in many ways, I still think I'm an imposter. Oh, why? I don't have the, the look at me, look at me, look at me, uh, superstardom diva. Or maybe some people would think I, I am diva -ish. I don't have that. I think acting is about giving service. I think acting, I think performing is about uh, projecting ideas to people. I think acting is ev evangelizing about morality, about a state of affairs, about everything. I don't think it's merely just entertainment. I think it's about disseminating information and the ideas, and of course, educating. I can't let you go without asking this final question. Um, you walked on the day your husband died. Yeah. You also walked on the day you got married. Yeah. That is a strong work ethic. Yeah. And, uh, and I think I speak, I've spoken to many people that have done, been on set, on production with you, and they always attest to how, um, how committed you had to your work. And the example I gave earlier, that's not a usual... That's an unusual way to express grief. What, how, what inspired, what made you take that decision? I'm, I've always been curious about that. I know it's boring, but it's about service because no, nothing is about you. I'm in a production. People have paid, their, paid for their ticket and they're doing that. So my husband died. So we stopped and then I won't be able to work. Uh, if I go to pieces, we stop the production. People come to the theater and they say, oh, sorry, we can't do anything today because uh, uh, the husband of one of our cast members died. What kind of indulgence is that? It is nothing to do with them. They cannot bring him back. So you get on with what you're doing. So it's another day in the shop. So you just do what you're doing. I honor him. He wouldn't even want me to do that. He wouldn't. He was in hospital and I was with him that day. And I remember him saying to you, don't be late. You got, that's a man who was about to die a few. Don't be, don't be late. You, you got to go. Because it's about service. If everybody knew my husband died, ah, Ekbelema, sorry, oh, sorry. Oh. It's not going to bring him back. And they can't comfort me anyway. Only you can comfort yourself. If you see what I mean, they're sympathetic. Uh, they will be sympathetic, but you disrupt every, everything because you are hurting. So I like to get real. Well, I call it getting real. I mean, other people's lives, another pe what happened to other people is important to me. And, and so I don't make everything me. Thank you so much. This has been a very wonderful time. We've learned so much uh, today. And uh, I look forward to speaking to you again. Have a lovely day. Let's do it again. Yes. Thank you so much. Uh, <laughs> that's what we do in Nigeria. <laughs> well, I'm sure you won't be.